Wellington's a bit strange. Out of Australia and New Zealand, it was the third city to operate electric suburban trains, but it's also tiny. So why did they? Why did this weird little capital choose to operate these rather charming looking barrel shaped trains? Well, it's an interesting story. Surprisingly, this story starts in the 1870s. At that time, there was only one line out of Wellington, that being the Wairarapa Line, which reached Lower Hutt in 1874 and Marston in 1880. Prior to that line being built, there was major consideration towards building a line along the west coast instead, but due to political shenanigans that are, for the most part, outside the scope of this video, I'm not going to go over that. And suffice to say, the Wairarapa Line was built first. However, by the end of the 1870s, the West Coast Line was once again under consideration. In 1878, the government under Premier George Grey announced the construction of a new line between Wellington and Palmerston North along the West Coast, only for them to lose the election in 1879, with the new government being headed by a man called John Hall. Due to more political shenanigans that are also outside the scope of this video, they cancelled the line as an austerity measure. In response, a man by the name of John Plimmer then proposed what can be best be described as an early form of public-private partnership, where the Wellington and Matawatu Railway Company would build and operate the line, but connected to a government line, and built to government standards. In 1880, this was approved, and construction began. So now we start to connect the dots. So if you know anything about Wellington, or you know anything about trains, you know that 1. Wellington is a very hilly place, and 2. Trains don't like hills. As a result, the line out of Wellington heading towards Tower Flat, nowadays known as Tower, was built very, very steep and very, very curvy. To put this in perspective, my British audience is probably already aware that the steepest mainline gradient in the United Kingdom is the Licky Incline with a grade of 1 in 37.7. For comparison, the line between Wellington and Tower Flat was 1 in 40, and this was a single track line with narrow gauge trains. Suffice to say, this limited greatly what could be hauled along the line. This was even to the point where the Wellington and Manawatu Railway Company were considering railway electrification as early as 1894, albeit not following through due to the infancy of the technology at the time. But as time went on, traffic volumes would continue to grow, and by 1908, the Wellington and Manawatu Railway Company would be bought out by the New Zealand government and formally integrated into New Zealand railways. In 1914, the government then made it clear that a potential deviation between Wellington and Tower Flat would be needed. And in 1915, they commissioned a report, which was handed down, although works were deferred until after the war. And after the war, and more political shenanigans, in 1924, the government authorised construction on the newer, straighter, flatter, and crucially, double-track Tower Flat deviation. This did leave a crucial question, though. What to do with the existing line? Well, the 1924 report suggests potentially handing it over to Wellington Council and converting it to a tramway. In 1924, the government commissioned the firm Mers and McKellen to consult on railway electrification in Dunedin, Christchurch, Wellington, and Auckland. And yes, if you're curious, it was the same Mersa McKellen that consulted Melbourne on its railway electrification system. When the report was delivered in August 1925, it only recommended electrification between Christchurch and Littleton, although it did discuss electrification of the Wellington Suburban Services, which it did suggest could be taken over by electric multiple units. The report doesn't go into detail a lot about what these multiple units would have been, but it did state that multiple units should be made up of two motor cars and four trailer cars, which would have been fairly novel for multiple units in Australia and New Zealand, as typically they have an equal ratio of motor and trailer cars. Alas, it doesn't matter, as the government decided to pursue other projects for the time being, and in 1927 announced that they were going to close the existing line when the Tower Flat deviation opened. You won't be surprised to find out that the locals weren't happy with this idea. And in 1931, the idea of electrifying the line once again read its head, with a community action group proposing an electric multiple unit service similar to that in Melbourne. Surprisingly, the government accepted this proposal, and in 1935, issued a tender for six two-car electric multiple units. To no surprise to anyone at the time, in 1936, English Electric won the contract, and in 1937, the tower flight deviation opened, at which point, the existing line was cut back to Johnsonville and became the Johnsonville branch we know today. The government then spent the remainder of 1937 electrifying the Johnsonville line, and in 1938, those fancy new electric trains arrived and began testing. And that gets us onto the fun stuff. So while the trains themselves would be known as the DM or DMD class, these specific trains, ordered in 1936, would be known as the 1936 stock, in a similar fashion to how deep-level tube trains in London are named. 
The cars themselves were evenly split between motor cars and trailer cars, with the motor cars being designated with a DM and the trailer cars being designated with a D. Because the plan was to operate them as two car sets, both car types had cabs, albeit the DM cars had a second cab at the rear, and this was mostly to operate late night services as single car sets, although this generally fell out of favour with over time and the second cabs were removed. The cars themselves had steel bodies with most of the equipment mounted under the frame. Motor cars were driven by four motors, one on each axle, and to the best of my knowledge were about 1500 volts, but I've yet to find a source to confirm that. The motors themselves produced about 150 horsepower each and were controlled by electro-pneumatic stepped resistor control, as you can probably guess, mounted under the frame. And braking was provided by electro-pneumatic brakes. Heating was provided by 10 150 volt heaters connected in series to run off the 1500 volt overhead supply. And auxiliary power was run off a 120 volt DC motor generator also mounted under the frame. In terms of seating, they had reversible transverse seating throughout the length of the car in a similar fashion to Sydney Suburban trains at the time. One thing that trains in Sydney and Melbourne didn't have that these trains in Wellington did have was power operated doors which wouldn't become standard on trains in Sydney and Melbourne until the late 1950s with the Sputnik and Harris cars. Quick editor's note, while it was the Sputniks in Sydney, turns out it wasn't the Harrises in Melbourne, it was the Hitachis in 1972, which I guess proves my point even more. <laughs> and traction interlocking, which I don't know when that became standard on new trains in Melbourne, but I know for Sydney, that was the Millenniums in 2002. Suffice to say, the 36 stock was actually fairly advanced at the time, especially with compared to their Australian cousins. So when the wires were energised on the 2nd of July 1938, and the first train left Platform 3 at Wellington, itself only a year old at the time, and made its way up the hill towards Johnsonville, it was no shock it was successful. Within the coming days, service improvements became obvious, with the total journey time reducing from 27 minutes with steam haul trains to only 19 minutes. This was even factoring in that the electric service stopped at two more stations. Not only were services faster, there were more of them, with daily services rising from 14 to 52 per day. So you won't be surprised to find out that the government and locals were delighted with this new service. Not only did it bring better transport to the area, but every suburb that was served by the line, it brought great economic opportunities. So of course in 1939, the government then announced that as soon as equipment was available, suburban service would extend all the way to Paikakariki. But if you know your history, you know that 1939 was the year that World War II started in Europe. And unfortunately, fighting the Nazis takes priority of the new train. Regardless, in 1940, electrification reached Paikakariki through the tariff flight deviation. And for the time being, suburban services to Paikakariki would be hauled by ED class electric locomotives. Unfortunately, the war situation would escalate. And in late 1941, New Zealand would find itself at war with Japan as well. For whatever reason, the government then in 1942 ordered three two-car sets for additional service on the Johnsonville line and extended service on the Paikakariki line. These trains are known as the 42 stock and they arrived after the war ended in 1946. For the most part, the wartime ordering of these trains is the most notable aspect of them as they were identical to the earlier 36 stock. As soon as they arrived, they were put into service and began working their way up to Johnsonville and out to Paikakariki alongside the 36 stock. Although these trains arriving in 1946 wasn't the most interesting thing to happen in that year. Like many countries in the wake of the Second World War, New Zealand was experiencing a massive population boom, and as a result, they were investing massively in housing. While today the Hutt Valley is a core part of metropolitan Wellington, at the end of the war, it was just a plain of rolling fields. There really wasn't much there. In 1946, to support the development in the Hutt Valley, the government announced a fairly ambitious upgrade project for the lines in the Hutt Valley. The main upgrade that's notable for us is the extension of the Hutt Valley branch line from Waterloo to Manor Park via Nainai and Taita. Once built, this would become the new route for the Wairarapa line, with the existing line then terminating a meddling and becoming a branch. As part of this, the government also announced that electrification would span as far as Upper Hutt. And as you can probably guess, that means more trains. So these new trains are known as the 46 stock, and they ordered quite a few. For comparison, the 36 and 42 stock altogether consisted of 9 motor cars and 9 trailer cars, while the new 46 stock, they ordered 40 motor cars and 71 trailer cars. One thing you may have just noticed is that the previous orders were for an equal amount of motor and trailer cars, while for this order, they were unequal. Well, why is that? Well, some would operate as two car sets, but the plan was to operate them mostly as three car sets, 
being built up to six cars during peak hours. And unlike the earlier stock, the 46 stock would actually differ, with the main alterations being the 46 stock was equipped with a larger motor generator for supplying two trailer cars instead of one, and the bogey wheelbase was increased from 2.29 metres to 2.99 metres. Additionally, the braking systems were upgraded. From what I've read, the doors also differed, but I'm not entirely sure that's the case. There's more information in the description below if you're curious. In 1949, the first of these units arrived in New Zealand, and began working on the Pikakariki line while the Hutt Valley works were taking place. In 1953, the first session of electrification in the Hutt Valley opened between Kaifarafara and Taita. As part of this, there was also a short stub to the Hutt Park race course, but this was only run on race days only, and it closed in 1966, so it's not really of note. In 1954, the final section of the Hutt Valley branch line opened, with the final section being completed between Taita and Manor Park. As a result, the former line was then cut back to Melling, it was then electrified, and became the Melling branch that we know today. In the following year of 1955, the electrification was extended between Taita and Upper Hutt, and most of the Wellington Suburban network that we know today was completed. In general, the 36 and 42 stock got operated as two car trains on the Johnsonville and Melling lines, while the 46 stock got operated as three car trains on the Paikakariki and Upper Hutt lines. In general, during peak hours, trains would be doubled up, so two car trains become four car trains, and three car trains become six car trains. For the most part, the next major development wouldn't really come until the 1970s. By this time, the suburb of Parapara Umu to the north of Paikakariki was beginning to grow, and there was a desire to extend suburban services there. Because electrification didn't span that far, three car EMU sets would be hauled north, typically by a DA class diesel electric locomotive. Sets used for this service would be equipped with additional batteries for lights and auxiliary power. In 1978, the 36 and 42 stock was starting to suffer heavily from reliability problems, and it was a desire from the government to get rid of the final locomotive hauled suburban trains in the Wellington area. As such, the government issued a tender, and in 1979, selected the Hungarian firm Garns Mavag to produce 44 new two-car sets designated as the EM and ET class. At the time, this was valued at $33 million, with this being the largest rolling stock order in New Zealand history at the time. Also in 1979, the computerized traffic monitoring system was introduced, and as a result, the remaining DM class units in service had to be renumbered. In 1982, the new Guns with Varg trains began to arrive, and began to gradually displace 36 and 42 stock trains. During this process, the Guns with Varg was taken over in the Paikakariki and Upper Hut lines, where the remaining 46 stock trains would be then merged into two car sets, which would then displace the 36 and 42 stocks on the Johnsonville and Melling lines. Once retired, the 36 and 42 stock would generally be stored for a bit, and then unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, all of them were scrapped. In the year of 1983, electrification was finally extended north between Paikakariki and Parapara Umu, and the locomotive hauled 46 stock trains ceased. Quick editor's note, I've got to put this in the original script, but between 1984 and 1986, 10 two-car sets were refurbished and painted into the green and cream livery, as well as having their single beam headlights replaced with twin beams. And now, as I was saying, the next major development for the remaining 46 stock trains came in 2006, where the government made it clear it wanted to replace them with 29 new two-car electric multiple units. In 2007, a consortium of Hyundai Rotem and Mitsui won the contract, and in the following year, Wellington Council then announced that the order would be extended by an additional 10 sets, and an additional 6 sets, for a total of 48 sets. In 2007, the Wellington Suburban Network started to suffer from overcrowding, and as a result, 46 stock trains that had been retired were reintroduced. The first was a stored unit made of DM216 and D2687, which they affectionately nicknamed Phoenix. And the second was a preserved unit owned by the Canterbury Railway Society, made up of cars DM27 and D163. These sets, curiously, were reintroduced alongside EO-class locomotives, from the Utira Tunnel in, on the South Island. These worked in a push-pull configuration, sandwiched between British Rail Mark II carriages. The reintroduced 46 stock and the EO-class locomotives would work until late 2011 and early 2012 before being re-retired. In 2010, the first of the new Matangi trains arrived and began testing on the Upper Hutt and Melling Line, with full service on the Upper Hutt and Melling Line expected to begin in January 2011, the Johnsonville Line in May, and the new Kapiti Line in July, the latter line being renamed after electrification was extended north from Parapara Umu to Waikanae in January 2011. Due to a variety of factors, the introduction of the new Matangi units was less than smooth to say the least. By March they began service on the Upper Hutt and Melling line, 
and on the Compete line in June, service on the Johnsonville line was delayed until March 2012, and in that same month, the final 46 stock service on the Johnsonville line took place, and the final service, altogether, took place on the Melling line on the 25th of June 2012, ending the 74-year history of the DM class in Wellington. Afterwards, the 46 stock faced a scrapper's torch, like its earlier 36 and 42 stock siblings, although a few sets were set aside for preservation. In one humorous case, Metling placed an ad for a two-car set on the website TradeMe for $29,990, listed as buyer to pick up, and with a bargain of 4.5 million kilometers on the odometer. See how much of a bargain this was? An over-enthusiastic four-year-old attempted to buy the train while playing on their mum's computer. Unfortunately, their mum asked Metling to cancel the bid, I'm assuming to that kid's great disappointment. The train was later sold to a man in Nelson in July 2011. Quite a few cars actually made it into preservation, with the previously mentioned Canterbury Railway Society having an operational set made of 46 stock cars, DM27 and D163, which you can see at their site in Ferrymead, just outside of Christchurch. The National Railway Museum of New Zealand also has 46 stock cars, those being DM216 and D26A7, which they have affectionately nicknamed Phoenix, and as you probably remember, were one of the two sets reintroduced in Wellington. The only three-car set that was preserved consists of D2411, DM556, and D2130, and it was officially nicknamed Cyclops. This was due to it still having its single beam headlights, as most stock was retrofitted with twin beam headlights. This unit I'm not entirely sure its state, as it appears to be owned by the Wellington Heritage Multiple Unit Trust, but they don't appear to have been active since 2020. So as far as I can tell, the unit is currently sold at the Rumitaka Incline Heritage Railway in Maymore. I wasn't able to find anything to confirm this or verify its location, so that's all I can say, unfortunately. Well, on that sour note, it's time to conclude this video. <laughs> if I were to use one phrase to describe these trains, it would be surprisingly impressive. While they were in service for far, far too long, they were surprisingly impressive at the time they were introduced, and had features that let them punch way above their weight when compared to their Australian counterparts. These were the final throws of an era where New Zealand railways would go above and beyond when it came to providing good service. It's sad that in the post-war years, New Zealand mostly followed the trend of car-dependent suburbia, and as a result, there were basically no developments in the post-war period. It was even to the point where cities like Dunedin and Christchurch, where they once considered railway electrification, ended up closing their suburban networks, and Auckland didn't even electrify until 2014. But I suppose that's just how things are, unfortunately. Either way, the DM class were impressive for the time, and I'm quite glad that quite a few made it into preservation. And now I just need to find a way to get to Christchurch so I can go ride one.